Well, thanks so much for having me, Volker. It's wonderful to see you after such a long time. Um, indeed, we got coffee back in the day in, in Freiburg. Uh, about, I would say, almost every other day, <laughs> at least for some for some period of time. So it's really wonderful to to reconnect here, um, albeit uh, virtually. Um, this is a project that I started a while ago. So some some sections, if you skim through it, um, if you have a chance to skim through it, might might be. Um, outdated as it relates to the companies and the company's names because we had some mergers, we had some we had some, some changes in the market structure. But I think and hope that the main argument still stands. The main argument is that there is a connection between industrial organization and content moderation and that that connection and that necessary uh, connection, um, uh, that necessary connection um, is oftentimes overlooked. It's oftentimes overlooked um, because we focus on or because discourse uh, focuses on either the content moderation problem or the industrial organization problem, but fails to bring the two together. So let me attempt to bring the two together. Um, the paper and the project is structured in uh, three parts. Um, uh, part one is a basic survey of the of the market and um, an explanation of why we see concentration in the digital public sphere. There's probably not that much new in there. The second part is about specific monopoly harms. Um, I divided those harms into two different categories of harms, harms to public discourse and harms to individual stakeholders. Um, and then I lay out why I think that antitrust um, as currently applied is ill suited to counter these types of harms. Um, the third and last part is dedicated to well, some thoughts on, on changes and reform and what we can hope from these changes as it relates to improving content moderation specifically. So let's start with um, part one, and I'll try to keep that somewhat short. Yeah, I saw in the in the in the in the um, in the I, I'm seeing in the chat. Yes, some people have seen um, earlier versions. This is um, I think a spin-off or like half of of this original version that was was now published. I'm I have taken the other half and I'm working on that, trying to uh, get it into article form at the moment. So. Um, start with the monopolized digital public sphere. So there are more or less roughly four different types of bottleneck, uh, bottlenecks for digital discourse. Um, there are video sharing platforms, there are search engines, there are uh, social and there are social media companies um, and there are app stores. And in each of those or as it relates to each of those bottlenecks, we have a highly concentrated market structure. The, um, the level of concentration um, that varies a bit between these different types of bottlenecks. So we certainly have more alternative uh, alternatives as it relates to social media platforms than we have as it relates to app stores. App stores is probably the most extreme of these bottlenecks where we either have complete monopolization or, or a duopoly, depending on how we define the market. And depending on what apps and what type of apps we're concerned about, we have exactly one player or we have two players. As it relates to social media, there's of course um, the, the biggest incumbent um, being, still being Facebook. And then um, we have some smaller competitors. We have some competitors that have become smaller since then. That would be Twitter, now X. We have some new emerging competitors that um, are still in their infancy see that be blue sky or mastodon or so but we see we see some we see some at least marginal competition and alternatives so why is that well there's a sort of standing old explanation that is that digital markets just tend to concentrate one that might be based on network effects. Two, that might be based on the characteristics of data. Three, that might be um, based on some sort of interrelation of network effects and data um, together. Um, in a separate project, I am trying to lay out why that sort of misses the legal structure that undergird that undergirds monopolies. But I want to leave that aside. This is sort of the conventional explanation. Probably, probably stands. Um, there are at least three different dimensions in which um, that or the, the in which that that power can play out can play out in 
Econ in terms of, in economic terms as market power can play out in political terms as political power that would be to say well if we have one big social media company that social media company has, has significant sway over say um, democratic elections and that can play out in terms of um, cultural power and um, cultural power could be something along the lines of if we have one um, if we have one big social media company well that social media company will have an outsized influence on say the development of language or the development of fashion or the development of art so there are different dimensions in which that in which um, in which that power can really play out. I want to focus on um, the next part a bit more because I think this is where content moderation and the monopoly structure, the, um, the infrastructural monopoly structure really intersect. So let's distinguish between threats to public discourse based on monopoly um, and harms to individual stakeholders, again, based on monopoly. So. As it relates to threats to public discourse, I think the biggest, the biggest problem and probably the strongest link between, um, between what I think is a flawed industrial organization structure and problems at the content level, that is that if you have a monopolized, a private monopolized um, infrastructure level, then that significantly raises the stakes of every single content moderation decision. Um, that is to say, um, if we have one big social media company or if we have one big, big app store, the decision on whether or not to platform or deplatform, say, a former president or whether to host a certain app has repercussions for the, in, for the, entirety, for the entirety of society. That is an arrangement that's of course possible, but it's an arrangement that kind of only makes sense if we have a very high degree of certainty that this one decision will be correct. And many other works have shown that um, content moderation decisions are one inherently, inherently, um, inherently uncertain um, as it relates to sort of their their correctness in 2020 hindsight and two we don't even know what we benchmark it against because in society as ours um, there's a huge bandwidth of opinions on what the correct decision would even look like so the biggest probably the biggest the biggest problem connecting or the probably the yeah the, the biggest threat to public discourse that directly results from a monopolized or flawed industrial structure is that it does raise the stakes of individual content moderation decisions to the extent that it breaks any attempt of platforms to um to uh, to deal with with that level of responsibility to the extent that it breaks any sort of effort by by governments to provide frameworks in which these platforms can operate and to the extent that it also breaks any reasonable trust that we can have in 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 single individuals say mark zuckerberg um, or sundai pinchai to make the right decision in an individual case now, second, and I'll try to keep these um, these other threats uh, a bit a bit shorter. Um, second, it creates monoculture, and um, what results from monoculture is sort of systemic fragility. We've seen that play out with the Facebook blackout um, in practice. When was that? Two or three years ago. And we've seen that in other areas of the industry, say the financial industry, that if you have a high level of monoculture, then a single shock to the system can break the entire system. And if that is a system that is crucial for the functioning of society, of democracy, then we might not want these single points of failure. It makes it easier for um, governments, and that's the third point, to instrumentalize these platforms, that is to say, to leverage them for government-sponsored censorship. Um, it is just broadly, that's the fourth point, just broadly incompatible with democratic notions of discourse that we concentrate um, so much power in the hands of very few individuals. And last, it um, arguably harms innovation as it relates to public discourse. Now. Switching um, to um, or shifting to harms to individual stakeholders, I again want to spend 
most most of the most of the time on a very I think very straightforward but oftentimes overlooked uh, type of harm and that is simply output harm so um, uh, several people have written about antitrust in zero price markets and i think most have concluded that antitrust should apply in zero price markets just as it should apply in any other type of market but then for some reason we haven't necessarily made that connection um, in the context of content moderation so if we have a high level of monopolization in a certain area whether that's app stores or whether that is whether that is um, whether that's social media it just ju should just be natural to assume that content moderation degrades um, because that's the way these monopolies can can engage in monopoly rent extraction if they want to keep the price at zero and if we assume that there's some trade happening between um, between platforms and individuals where individuals get platform services and these platform services they include well the provision of connection they improve they include the sorting of information and they include content moderation at least to some extent and on the other hand um, on and in the other direction um, the individuals are providing their data they're providing their attention they're providing themselves and their engagement as part of the network to make the network more valuable well and if I, at the same time, as the monopolist, want to keep the price at zero, what can I do? Well, I just degrade quality. And that it should be very straightforward to make that connection between, well, a highly, highly, highly monopolized industrial structure and a degrading in quality. And we have some, some we have seen some, at least some um, factual evidence for that actually happening. Um, second, um, there is an uh, elevated risk or potential if you want for discrimination um, which simply goes along the line that of course market concentration um, doesn't cause um, doesn't cause um, price discrimination or other forms of, uh, of discrimination but it makes it easier it makes it easier and um, we have seen again some factual evidence that um, price discrimination is happening even on the biggest on the biggest platforms. If you if we think back to the um, to the Wall Street Journal's reports from two or three years ago that they provide special treatments for um, or that they provided special treatment for celebrities in the form of more due process in the form of um, allowing them to post things that other people ordinary users uh, would not be allowed to post. Um, that um, that they that they get reinstated much more easily after having been uh, after having been deplatformed. That is basically a form of price discrimination. Again, based on the assumption that there's some sort of trade between of, of platform services and my engagement. Um, third and last, there might be there's just higher. Um, there's just a higher propensity for exclusion um, and that just results from a lack of alternatives for marginalized groups. Um, related to that, um, we have also seen some evidence or one has seen some evidence that um, that there is severe underinvestment in sort of more niche, uh, more more niche parts um, of the content moderation structure. That is to say that, Content moderation algorithms are not fine-tuned to to properly properly assess um, either minority dialects or minority languages. And again, one I guess can plausibly make the argument that that is one side effect of um, of highly concentrated markets. Um, now, antitrust could of course address these things, but it in its current current form it really doesn't and um, there are at least three main issues why I think in that area antitrust as current as it currently understood and applied just doesn't do the trick one is the consumer welfare standard but that's some sort of um, old debate we can go into detail in Q&A the second is that the levels um, for um, in for um, enforcement especially for enforcement um, against unilateral you know, action are just too high for what pluralistic discourse would require 
Um, in, in Europe, the thresholds are slightly are somewhat lower than in the than in the US. But even in Europe, you need quite high market shares before any sort of enforcement um, against unilateral action would kick in. And now I don't even want to enter the debate on whether that is like overall maybe defensible. Who knows? The argument is only that for public discourse. These thresholds, uh, these thresholds are too high because they they don't work towards guaranteeing pluralistic pluralistic markets um, on 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 which pluralistic discourse could could be built. And third, there's the behavioral requirement um, that's at the center, at the core um, of um, of any sort of antitrust liability. Now, if we look at these platforms and if we look at the potential harms that they might cause to public discourse, for example, that it raises the stakes of individual content moderation decisions or that it does create monoculture. Well, there's no behavioral element for which one could find um, for which one could find um, antitrust liability leaving mergers aside, of course, but um, there is no there's no there's no way to handle just organic growth that does lead to monoculture. But for public discourse, that is still a problem. There is no way to 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 litigate organic growth of a platform that raises the stakes for individual content moderation decisions. But yet for public discourse, those raised stakes are a problem. Now, um, coming to the last part, I suggest some, some, or I should say, I discuss because obviously I'm not the first one to to uh, um, to make those suggestions. I discuss some um, potential some potential remedies, and I'm limiting myself here to interoperability and more structural approaches to antitrust. But first, um, let me make a cautious, but very cautious sort of case for digital pluralism. I'm fully aware that there are trade-offs um, when we move to, um, when, when, if we were to move from a monopolized structure to a more, a more pluralistic infrastructure structure for public discourse. If your main goal, or maybe even only goal, for example, is to get hate speech off digital platforms, you might prefer a highly centralized structure um, you might prefer a tightly regulated, highly centralized structure, um, because that would be the most efficient way to get bad content off um, of um, of those platforms. So there is clearly a trade-off. But are we really sure what that content would be that we want to that we would want to ban? Like, are we are we and by we I mean sort of as a society are we in a place where we can pinpoint to say this is the exact line that we need to draw? We have that consensus in some areas like child pornography and revealing nuclear secrets, but that's about it. Beyond those those extreme extreme cases, there is no agreement whatsoever, and um, and and with, with that lack of agreement. I'm just not sure whether sort of a hope for a centralized structure in order to get rid of bad content um, is 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 any politically plausible approach. Second, past experience teaches us that a centralized structure was not really good at getting rid of bad content. Um, it was just it didn't work the way. There was plenty of bad content on on these platforms. And third. It very much depends. The answer to how centralized or decentralized you want the structure to be very much depends on um, where you see the biggest threat to democracy emerging. And there are at least two ways in which you can see um, threat to, democ uh, to uh, democratic discourse emerging. One is the old, uh, the old saga around echo chambers. So the story goes something like, well, if like-minded people talk too much among themselves and seclude themselves from others, then they get radicalized. I'm, I'm not so sure whether there's um, whether that has held up against empirical evidence, uh, but that's certainly one sort of narrative that's being told. But there is another one. Um, oh, I should add, and of course, if you were now to to create pluralistic markets, then maybe that increases um, the risks for 
uh, for digital echo chambers because you would have all those small networks and people would uh, would uh, would self-sort into those networks and that might make things worse for the people in those small networks. There's a different story um, to be told and that is that the real threat for democracy is not that a couple extremists hop in their own echo chambers, but the real threat for democracy is that um, there are some extremists and they um, have they have they can reach people at the boundary. And if that is your real concern, meaning that um, there are a couple extremists, but we can't help those extremists anyway, but what we what 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 the real problem is that they might continuously reach and and uh, incorporate more people sort of at the boundary. Um, well, then a splintering, if you want, into different platforms is maybe not the worst idea because it just secludes extremists and prevents them from, from, from reaching out further. So it really depends on where you see the main threat. With all that said, with all these caveats, with a cautious case um, for pluralism, um, I want to sort of focus in on two types of remedies. One has been extensively discussed recent, as of recently, that's interoperability. So the basic idea is platforms shouldn't be able to um, fence themselves in. They should allow for communication across platforms. And the, there are plenty of historic uh, of, uh, historical examples um, or blueprints to draw from. Well, it's possible for an AT&T customer to call someone on T-Mobile and vice versa. And that leads to a sort of diminishing of uh, network effects in a sense um, as they can be used um, as they can be used for monopolization of the market. Those network effects, of course, continue to exist. Ex well, I should say they, they increase because now you increase the, the, the network by making the network, by, by creating interoperability beyond the boundaries um, of, the, of the original network. But they accrue at a different level. Those network effects, they no longer accrue at the level of the um, of the of the firm of the operator of that network, but they accrue at the level of the market because that's where people can um, now communicate. There have been success, well, as a, in regulatory senses, uh, in a regulatory sense, I should say, successful initiatives in passing these standards as it relates to messengers in Europe. Um, in the US, not that much has happened um, as it relates to interoperability. And in Europe, it's also limited to digital uh, to, to messaging systems. And that could, of course, be expanded. It could cover aspects of social media. It could cover um, app stores. It could cover, um, it could cover um, video sharing platforms and so on. So that's the first part. The second part is maybe maybe there was something to the um to the demands of the likes of turner um in the 1970s and so on that one should move towards more uh, a more structural notion of antitrust that is to say um why should one focus on bad behavior if bad structure might be sufficient to intervene and that would, of course, be a sort of very fundamental reform to the basis, uh, to the basic rules of antitrust. Um, but it might be one worth considering. And there are um, sort of historical precedents, especially in the area of media. It's just that we have either abandoned those uh, notions of industry specific um, sort of market share limits um, or where they still exist. Uh, Germany still has some some of those um, in the area of television, for example, and so on, Rundfunkstaatsvertrag, um, but um, they haven't been transported, tra they haven't been applied um, to, um, to digital platforms yet. And that is certainly something to think about. And whether or not it's best to go sort of with an industry um, specific approach and say, well, this is something that we should try to um, try to pick up um, uh, from the area of traditional media and like revive and then apply specifically to digital platforms or whether we say, hey, this was actually a good idea for antitrust in general and maybe we should try to revive um, those thoughts around structural notions of antitrust across the board. Well, that's a certainly open question and there, I guess, um, 
arguments um, arguments for both of these approaches. Ultimately, it will come down to probably a political calculus of what one thinks is more realistic um, to pass. And with that, thanks so much for your attention. More than excited to um, take your questions. I already see a bunch in the um, I already see a bunch in the chat here, but maybe we can also just switch to switch to an, 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 a nice little chat here.